Hi there, welcome to the first F-Sharp online meetup ever, I think, in the world. Um, I see that there are like more than 150 people waiting, which is pretty awesome. I'm pretty excited and also pretty nervous. And the good thing is I don't have to do too much. So my name is Roman and we are doing this F-Sharp online meetup at the moment with two people. And there's also the other Roman from from Czech and but today it's only me and Scott later on being here because we're using Zoom and OB uh, we're not using Zoom we're using just YouTube with OBS and we can't really have a lot of people in there because then we get some bandwidth problems and and Skype problems and all this stuff but first of all I'm really happy that so many people are here it's not only 12 F sharp developers in the world so I'm really happy about this and this whole thing started because everyone had to cancel their meetups and so I, I had to cancel my meetup which was also today which was funnily enough about property based testing which is a pure coincidence and um, Roman the other Roman also had to cancel his meetup and so we thought maybe let's just do something about it and let's try this F sharp online thing and, and see if we can bring the whole community together. So this turned out pretty good actually. So I have a really awesome guest today for the first thing I asked him and he immediately said yes for this um, meetup. And I'm really thankful about this, but it seems, Scott, you're still there. Yes, you're still there. Um, okay, so um, we have the mighty Scott Vlashin here talking about property-based testing. So I'm trying to put him in here. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> so can I see you? Yeah, um, we see you at least. Let me yeah, let me go. let me check the stream. Um, so yeah, hello everyone from Spain and quarantine. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So I think we're basically maybe 30 seconds behind um, with the live stream. So if you have any questions or you write anything and we don't um, really react to this, it's, it's because of this is something between 15 and 60 seconds behind. Um, so if you have any questions, just put them in the chat, especially while, while Scott is talking later on. And I'll try to, to be the host or the moderator and ask the important questions, <clears throat> I think. We're planning, what, what, what did we say, Scott? We're planning for about 90 minutes, maybe? 90 minutes. Okay. Plus, plus Q&A, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, as you see, Scott's bandwidth is not the best. <laughs> so I hope when, when, we, when he's switching off his camera that um, we won't have too many problems. Um, and as you see, sometimes his, his, uh, the size of his video is also changing. I have no clue why this is the case. On Tuesday, we had about two hours trying to figure stuff out. Um, okay. Before we start, I really want to show you a couple of things. So let's go to my screen and see. Okay, Scott is also small and I don't want him to be that small in here. So, so if, you, if, you only, uh, if you have only seen my tweet um, about this, we have this new cool meetup group here about F Sharp Online. And it would be awesome if, if anyone could join this group. So the cool thing is that the F Sharp Software Foundation is, is actually sponsoring all this stuff. So they are paying for, for the meetup group and maybe for, for some other things in the, uh, in, the, in the future as well. Um, so this is pretty cool. So we have already more almost 150 50 members in there. It would be great if we had 150 soon. Now Scott gets bigger again. This is <laughs> very nice. Uh, anyway, I, I'll leave it here. And before we start, I really, I really want to to um, use the opportunity um, of this huge audience to to promote one thing, and this is basically Zaid, Zaid the judge. Um, he's he's a machine. I don't know how he's doing all this stuff, and and he is just. Um, putting out so much 
um, open source stuff for the F# -sharp community. He's he's writing <clears throat> a lot of stuff and he's doing great great work. I think. And about I ha I had to check this about and I have this tweet here um, from last year where he showed me that he had something like something cooking and it was his new Elmish book and I was reading this it was in June I, I was honored to be the first one to to be able to actually read this and proofread this and and talk about this with him and I was so excited and I really wanted to push him and and to publish all this stuff but it took he took his time and it took much more time than expected and we did a lot of streams and most of the stuff of the streams was content from this book actually but now two days ago or three days ago he he published this elmish book so if you're in any way just interested in ui development so user interfaces front end and if you're especially interested in in the whole elm architectures thing <coughs> and fable the the f sharp um to, to JavaScript transpiler compiler, um, you you need to read this book. It's it's, I just don't know. It's it's an awesome book. He put so much effort into this. It's it's really from the first from the basics, and he goes really deep with a lot of stuff. And it's not only the Elm architecture, and it's not only this. It's it's also how Fable works, um, how this whole transpiling things works, um, how Webpack works, and oh, not everything, of course, about Webpack, but it's it's just a tremendous book, and I, I I urge everyone just to read this and and put stars on this and GitHub and maybe even also somehow somehow use this GitHub sponsoring for I don't know if you set this up, but I think it's really worth it, and that's it. Um, so yeah, this is what I just wanted to get. Um, done while everyone is here. So for now, let's go to the talk. Um, I'd say first of all, I go to the both of us. And now you're big again. Let me let me change <laughs> this. This is funny. Um, just maybe tell us what or do you want to tell us or do you want to really just start yeah. with the with the talk? No, I'll just tell you. I mean, the, 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 I did this talk originally, actually, about six years ago, I think. And um, unfortunately, it got lost when Skills Matters shut down. Ah. So there's actually no recording of it on the Internet. So this is an opportunity to hear it again. And it's really when I was trying to understand property-based testing, it seems very, very mysterious. And I had a lot of trouble kind of understanding why it was different from kind of normal testing. So I put this talk together really to explain it to me. And hopefully it will be useful to other people too who don't who don't really understand who've heard about it but don't really understand how it works in practice. So I'm in this talk. I'll be really starting from the very basics. Uh, build, build basically build our own property based testing thing, and then we'll compare it with the the FS check library, which is much better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So then. Um... <clears throat> We just go. We, as I said, we, we we've planned for about ninety minutes and uh, some Q and A in the end. But we'll see how tired everyone is, and if we need a break, we we make a short break. We'll see how this will work out. We we have never actually yeah. done this, and in the future, one thing um, I I really want to use Zoom for this stuff, because then we can have a panel of a couple of people and we can stream this directly to to YouTube. So then also Roman can be there and. I also talked already with Don, and he's eager to come here, and uh, Don Syme. And um, so, and then people can like raise their hands and get their audio and get the, the video, and, and we really can get this meetup thing going. But for now, we have this, and I'm really happy that we can actually um, start with this. So, I am switching. You need to share your screen now, Scott. Okie dokie. And uh, share screen, modern technology. No, that's not me. That's so. so can people see that okay? I can see it. It's basically yeah. Now it's in there. So we see this. Uh, and um, I'm just going to turn my video off as well, yeah, just to save. I make right, it a bit. There you go. A bit. Can you say something again, just to to to, to yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully okay. everyone can see this. I call this the lazy programmer's guide. Because there's a famous thing about, you know, the best programmer is a lazy. And uh, I don't want to write thousands of tests by hand. I want to have the computer awesome. create the test for me. So if you're lazy, 
This is a good thing <laughs> yeah, for you. That's the, okay. So. Also, by the way, I, I have a GitHub. Uh, oh, you're gone? Yeah. Oh. I have a I have actually put the code that I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. Cool. So. And uh, so this prop based testing talk on on my GitHub if you want to play along. Awesome. So I will just uh, can you can you and... put, uh, you're not on the stream right? Um, I will just let me just put this here. It's GitHub com as flashing slash prop based testing talk so i will um, put this into the chat and and also in the video description later on okay i will turn my mic off now so i can 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 yeah. eat my chocolate while watching and um if is, if anyone has some questions <laughs> okay. put them in there and all if, right so we, we I... said like if if there are any questions that are pretty important i just interrupt you right okay Yes, please do. And you yeah. need to turn your mic on first, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In case it's mute. So, yeah, because I can't see and I can't see anything. I'm completely flying blind here. So hopefully everyone can hear me and yeah, we'll, uh, everyone can see my screen. We'll see. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. See you later. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is um, a, a thing that I was going around. I thought this is very good. This is the uh, – I think we're all, we're all working in the same direction, but we have to, like – stay away from each other unfortunately so i thought that was pretty funny right okay so as i said um part of this is to try and understand property based testing from the very beginning like why would you even bother and so um it, it reminds me of a conversation i had uh with a remote developer once um this is kind of exaggerated. It's a very exaggerated conversation, but I think you'll see where it's going. So it was a project a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And um, for some reason, we needed a, a function that added two numbers. And in fact, in this case, it wasn't really that, but I'll use, I'm going to be using adding as the example here. So I, you know, I text this person and they say they finished implementing it. Uh, and then I say, well, have you got any tests for it? And they say, uh, you want tests? Um, they were kind of a, you know, that really set me off on the wrong foot already. Um, so they said, yeah, I wrote a test. You know, if you've got one and three, you'd expect the out to be four. And uh, they, were, they were lazy. They were a really lazy developer. And so I would say, you know, that's only one test. One plus three equals four. How do you know it doesn't fail for other inputs? How do you know that it might not work for other things? So he said, okay, uh, let me do another one. And he wrote another awesome test. Uh, and two and two is also four. So that's pretty awesome. We now have two amazing tests to test this uh, add function. Um, and here's the problem. is you're only testing for special cases. And I mean, how do you know it doesn't fail for other things you haven't thought of? Um, and this is, you know, this is a... Uh, a serious, a serious question. I mean, like, when do you stop? Like, he says, you want more than two tests. How many tests do you want? And if you, if you were writing a function that added two numbers together, how many tests would you write before you felt confident that it was a, a good function, a good piece of code? You know, it's two tests, four tests, hundred tests. How many tests is too many? How many tests is too few? So. I didn't really trust this guy, so I decided to look at the unit tests and write them himself. So the, he, had, he had some existing unit tests. Here we are. When I add one and three, I expect to get four, and that passed. And then uh, when you add two and two, you expect to get four, uh, and that passed too. And okay, well that's good. The tests are passing. Let me let me write a test as well. Let me write a third test. Uh, if I add minus one and three, I expect to get two. Now when I ran that test, it failed. And I was thinking, well, well, that's kind of funny. Why why did it fail? So let me go and have a look at the implementation of what this person wrote. Okay, so the implementation he wrote, when you add X and Y, the answer is four. That was his implementation. Right? And it's like that's not that's that's not the kind of implementation I was expecting. So I said, okay, you know, let me write the test we're going to do test first development proper tdd i'm going to write the test first and then he has to make them pass and that's test first with the developers he can't you know that way i control how it goes so he says fine so i'm going to write some tests like this if i add two and three 
that's 5. And if I add uh, 1 and 41, that's 42. And um, he made these tests passed. And I thought, hey, that's pretty good. Okay, he's not as stupid as I thought he was. But, but let, let me just double check the implementation again. And so this is his implementation. So obviously he had special case, the two tests, and in all other cases it was four. And it's like, what what is hell is going on here? So I was like, what are you even doing? Why haven't you implemented anything? And he said to me, chill out, I'm totally following TDD best practices. And he pointed me to various websites that said something like this. You only write enough code to make the failing test pass. And that's exactly what he was doing. And this is a very common thing. It's like, I'm not sure that's what they meant. Anyway, okay. So let me write Let me write a whole bunch of tests. I mean, I'm trying to get ahead of him in terms of beating what he would do. So I've got some more tests like this. And he looks at, you know, this is, he just responds with another implementation, which just has special cases. So this is not going well, okay? This this person I'm working with is not a normal developer. <laughs> okay, there's a person and a lazy and malicious programmer. The end of okay, this is somebody and I use Garfield as the name because this person is lazy and stupid and malicious. They really want they try to do everything the worst possible way. So I'm thinking how can I how can I write code that will beat him? Right? What can I do that I can write code that he can't possibly mess up? Now, if I write example-based code, any specific example is going to fail because he's going to write a test that just has that example in it. So I can't do that. I can't use specific examples in my code. So what can I do instead? Right, what can I do? Well, how about using random numbers? So he can't he can't know in advance what the numbers are going to be. So if I add two random numbers together, so I, this is the test I wrote. I take two random numbers and I add them together and I expect them to be the same as adding them together. And if I do it a hundred times, just to make sure he didn't get stuff um, by chance. Okay, so this is my final my final test. I take, for a hundred times, I take two random numbers and I see what I expect them to be and then I compare it with what he actually wrote. And this is great. The problem solved, he can't possibly beat this, right? He can't possibly beat it because he doesn't know what the numbers are. But, but there's a tiny, tiny little problem. This is the tiny little problem, which is that I'm implementing, in order to test his function, I'm using an add function. And now how do I know that that function works? I mean, I'm basically re-implementing re his code to get the expected answer. And that's a very common thing you see when you write example-based tests is you basically, in order to see whether you've got the right answer or not, you have to re-implement the thing in the first place. And I've seen that quite a lot, and that's really a bad idea. So how can I test add without using plus? I mean, how can I even test something when I, you know, when, when I, we're not allowed to use the library function to implement it? Okay, so how can you, how, I mean, think about it. how would you test plus or add if you're not allowed to know about addition or anything like that? So this brings us on to property-based testing. So the way we think about property-based testing, you think is what are the requirements for the add function? We had a bunch of examples saying that 2 plus 2 is 4, but that's not a requirement. That's not a specification. So what is the actual requirement for writing the function? We never We never bother to write it down. We just kind of wrote some examples. It's not the same thing as a requirement. So this is where you're, this is where it starts hurting. Your brain is not, we're not very good at better thinking of this stuff. Mathematicians like this stuff, but most developers don't really like this stuff. But here's a good tip. What you do is you compare it with something with, which, is, which you know is different. So you don't know what it is, but you know what it isn't. So you, know, you don't really know how to define what addition is, but you know that addition is different from subtraction. Right. So how how does dif uh, addition differ from subtraction? Well, one obvious thing is that the order makes a difference with subtraction. Like five minus three is not the same as three minus five. So let's write a test to do that. If I add two numbers, the result doesn't depend on the parameter order. Okay. So I have two random uh, integers, 
Now, see, I've got the first result and the second result, and the, I don't actually need to know what the results are. I'm just testing, are they the same? So if I reverse the parameters, I should get the same result back. And that's good. So that eliminates subtraction. The, the, the enterprise developer from hell cannot use subtraction as an implementation. And he can't use that pattern matching thing uh, as a, an answer, right? So that eliminates the whole thing. But he's clever. He's really, really clever. So he re implements add like this. He implements it as a multiplication because he's evil. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, how can I, that, these, this one works, that passes that test. Okay, so that test passes, but it's still got the bad implementation. Okay, so let's think about what's the difference between uh, addition and multiplication. Can we think of a counterexample? Um, so, yeah, one thing is that adding one and one and one is like adding two ones is the same as adding two. Now, multiplying by one twice is not the same as multiplying by two. So that's a really obvious difference. So let's write a little test like this. If you add one twice, right? So I'm going to, the first result is one plus one, and the second result is two. Now, for addition, they should be the same thing. But for multiplication, they're not the same thing. So that's good. So let's see what he does. Well, he just implements it as subtraction. Now, subtraction, if you subtract one twice, it's the same as subtracting two. So he's made the test pass now, but we have the other test as well, which says it depends on parameter order. It doesn't depend on parameter, so it fails that one. So by combining these two different tests, uh, we guarantee that he can't um, have an evil implementation. Right? It, we've eliminated subtraction and multiplication both. So I have, I'm thinking, I'm pretty proud of myself right now. And I'm thinking, you know, I wonder if he can beat me on this. And yes, he does beat me. This is his implementation. To add two numbers together, return zero. Now, what the, what is this going? Well, it turns out that if you add one twice and it's just zero, that's the same thing. And if it doesn't depend on the parameter order. So it passes these two tests now. So I'm stuck. So these I thought these were pretty good tests, but I'm going to have to add another test. So one of the problems so far is we're not actually using the numbers, the random integers that we you know. So what we're going to do is we have to have something that's connected, something that's really part of addition. Is there, we said we can't actually know what the answer is because we're not supposed to, we can't really cheat and know what the answer is. But there is actually one thing where we can know the answer without implementing add. And that is adding by zero. So we know if you add zero to something, we get the same thing. So let's write a test for that. Okay, so we take a random integer and we add zero to it. And the second thing is the original thing. And the original thing and the add zero should be the same thing. Right, now this, the zero test will not pass that because the first one will be zero and the second one will be the original number. So this, that, that fixes this. So finally, finally, he's defeated. Uh, he can't. Fix or he can have passed some of these tests, but he can't pass all of them. So if we, and it turns out that if all these are true, we actually have a correct implementation of addition. Not quite true if you're a mathematician, but it's close enough. So let's refactor this. We have a lot of this kind of uh, loop where we generate some random numbers, but this time let's pass in a function. Um, they all had a very similar to structure, but let's let's parameterize the function that we pass in. And we're going to call this thing a property. It's a property of the thing. So we're going to compare the two random integers with some function. Now, the function might be adding one twice. It might be adding zero or whatever. OK? So this is property-based testing right here. We pass in a property, and we test it for various random inputs. And if the property is true for every single input, then it passes the property-based test. And if it isn't, then it fails, and it tells you which one. So here's our, here's our commutative property, which is the parameter order. We take the two parameters, and we swap them, and we expect to get the same result. And then when we want to test it, we just say, use that property check function and pass in that property as a parameter. 
and it'll take that it'll it'll for you know for 100 times it will generate two random numbers it will call that property with these two random numbers it will call the add for each of them and it will compare the results so they have to be the same so that property gets run 100 times and the one where we're adding one twice that's our property we basically we add one twice and we add one twice again uh, we add one twice and we add two and they should be the same and then when we want to call it in our test again we use this property check and we pass in the parameter that we pass into the property check is our function that we defined up above and if you're a mathematician this adding once twice and then two that's the same as associativity uh, which i didn't bother to write an implementation for but this is almost good enough to uh, you could probably make it fail but i can't be, think i can't think of a way to make it fail right now and then the identity is if you add zero to something it's the same as the original thing and then to test it we call that function 100 times with random numbers so i can actually demo this so um let me just clear everyone can see this screen now and uh yeah I, I can hear you fine yep right so there's my random number generator now i don't want to deal with overflow right now so i'm just generating numbers between uh 10, 000. if you can as exercise the reader what happens if you get to 32k or 4 gig or whatever it is right okay so here's our property checking uh thing and we pass in a property now notice the property has two parameters an int and an int and it returns a bool so that's our definition of a property so here is our good implementation but i'm just going to show you if, here's our bad implementation which uses subtraction so we're going to define adding two numbers and subtracting them together which is obviously a bad implementation so here is our property and then here's our test and i'm using expecto here so expecto the way you run expecto is uh there's actually a property check function built in. Um, so this is, uh, sorry, no, this is not the expected. This is just uh, my property check. I'm basically taking this function and running it 100 times with different values, and I'm sticking it in the expecto test. Expecto does have its own property test now. We'll see that in a minute. All right, so I have run that. So let's run it, and it says one test run. So, oh, no, yeah, what did it say? It said it failed. Oh, yeah, commutatively failed. It failed for these two random numbers. It failed for minus 1744 and minus 4252. Random numbers up to 10,000. So it's kind of, um, uh, you know, it's hard to know why it failed. That's one of the problems at this point. It's like we know it failed, but we're not quite sure. Now, if I use the good addition uh, implementation here, and I have to, I've kind of hard coded the implementation in here. I go down here and let me just scroll down so if i implement that and now it says success so there you go and i can do the same thing for the other ones here's my adding once twice and i'm in i just run expect to test that uses that property and i run the expect past and then here's the identity property now notice that in these properties I've defined every property has to have two parameters, which are both ints. So uh, in the identity property, I don't use the second parameter. So if you actually look at the definition, the second parameter has been genericized because I'm not using it. So it's kind of rigid. This is a very rigid uh, implementation I have. And it'd be nice if we had an implementation that would be much more flexible. Indeed, we will have one in a minute. So anyway, so this is my homemade uh property test and again if i put in um the bad implementation of zero for example and i run these this one failed it said that if you give the, if the numbers are four eight two six and minus 130 it's like the thing so that's good right so that's Everything you need to know about why property testing is better than example-based testing, because we're generating 100 random numbers rather than one or two tests. Um, we've generated hundreds of tests. So 
here's the thing about testing. Here's the te here's the properties we had. We didn't have the or the parameter order doing once, twice, adding zero does nothing. And these properties apply to every possible input you can think of. So because of that, because we're generating random inputs, we have a very high confidence that the implementation is correct. We're not just checking it for small numbers. Uh, you know, we it's very easy when you're writing example-based tests to focus on things that you understand, like zero and small numbers. You might forget to test negative numbers. You might forget to test numbers that are near the overflow point and so on. So, um, you know, this is a much better way of doing it. And these things, again, these, these properties that we've actually come up with, not just a test, but the specification for how addition is supposed to work. So it's really changed from writing examples to actually defining what that function should do uh, in, a, in, a, in a way which works for everything. Um, so this is, this is one of the nice things about property-based testing. It sort of forces you to think about what is this thing supposed to do, even if I didn't know what the answer was. You know, for any input, what's it supposed to do? Not just for two and two is four, but for every two integers, what's it supposed to do? And because we're focusing on the specification now, you can't create a bad implementation because this is actually the specification. Anything that meets these properties is the correct implementation. And it's for, like I say, it's forced us to understand the requirements in a much deeper way uh, that we wouldn't normally do when we're just writing example-based tests. So you might say, well, I've been deliberately coming up with the worst possible tests with the worst, most evil possible person. Um, you know, real life isn't like that, right? Surely this kind of thing is completely over the top. And I believe that's not true. You know, so there's evil people like, like that person I was working with. There's stupid people. There's lazy people. And what? What's interesting is that from a different point of view, certainly when writing tests, it's all the same. Whether you're deliberately writing bad tests or being stupid and writing, writing bad, lazy, 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 and writing, writing bad, 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 bad tests, tests, they're all bad tests. It doesn't really make any difference so they're, they're, these three these three people are basically the same from our point of view uh, Roman, Roman can you hear me okay So we experienced some sound problems with Scott. I, I just unmuted me. Um, can you say something again? Try it out. Yeah. Can can everyone see the screen? The screen is the screen is good. Can everyone hear my voice? Hopefully. Yeah. Um, let's. Okay. Just just keep going. I will tell you if it's if it gets worse again. Okay. Yeah. Just interrupt yeah. and tell yeah. me to stop, and I'll try again. Okay. So. I was just saying the the difference. There's no difference between evil and yep. stupid and lazy people, and um, the real reason problem is that the stupid person I always have to deal with is me. I am the stupid person. I am the person who's who's too lazy to write tests or write or they write bad tests because I often I don't understand what the tests I'm writing when I first start writing a project. I don't really understand them. So I am actually the enterprise developer from hell. So especially, and we all know this, when you look at your old code, you always think, oh my God, that's terrible. You know, now that I understand things better, I would have written different code. So, um, and it's not being evil, it's just more not really know what I'm doing until I've finished doing it, you know. All right, so let's talk about quick check. And so we've seen a, a homemade uh, property-based test. Now let's look at the professional one. Uh, and they're normally called Quick Check, and they're similar like that because um, Quick Check was a toolkit built uh, originally for Haskell, I think, by um, John Hughes and Kern Klassen. I don't know how you say that. Um, and of course, it's been the example for many other languages, including Scala and including F Sharp. And uh, in F Sharp, we have something called FS Check, which is awesome as well. 
Um, so let me show you how these things work. Um, you have some sort of property that you want to test, which I said the property is just a function that returns a Boolean. Either the thing's true or it's false. And you feed it into uh, your the checker API. And it basically is very simple. It says, check this property. And what the, it does then is there's inside there, there's a generator which generates random inputs, just like we generated 100 random integers, except it's much cleverer than that. Uh, and it knows how to generate ints and strings and dates and booleans and everything. And furthermore, there's a thing called a shrinker, which creates the minimal input. Now, in the example I just did, the homemade one, when it failed, it failed with two very large random numbers, you know, minus four, 4,500 and something and plus 8,000 something. It's, like, it's really hard to understand what those numbers mean. It'd be nice if the numbers were the smallest possible numbers that would make sense. And that's what the quick check does as well. So when do we actually use it? Here's our, here's our property. Again, we define our property. And then we just say uh, quick check. We've got FS check is the, is the DLL. And the namespace is check and quick is the uh, uh, method. Um, and there's much more complicated methods, which I'll show you, but that's will get you there most of the. And then the output says it passed 100 tests, because it by default, it runs with 100 random inputs. So let me demo this too. So here is the F. Let me just make sure it's all set up again. Um, right, so here is our good implementation of add. And here's our community property. And, and so here we go. We've got our function, and we just say quick there's past 100 tests. And if I have a bad function, let's change it to be minus, for example. And I run it again. It says. Um, and just make this a little bit bigger. It says one and zero. Now, originally it found two and zero, but then it kind of shrunk it to make it as small as possible. And it says the smallest possible inputs I can find is one and zero. So if you pass one and zero, it's not the same, you know, as zero and one because it's subtraction. So that's nice. It gives you, a, rather than the other one gave me like these massive thousands of something, this gives me nice small numbers that I can understand. And you can do the same thing in Expecto. Um, uh, just uh, in Expecto, there's a there's a built-in thing called test property. Uh, so you just pass in this property just like we did before, and then if we run it, there is the Expecto output, and it has, it has the same output. So the overall test fails. And if you want the integration, there's the link to the GitHub page with the integration on it. And again, we can do the same thing. So the properties, we've defined the properties exactly the same way as we did um, uh, with um, the homemade one. But it's just, you know, uh, it's a lot easier. We've got a much nicer uh, input here. So I won't go through all this property. So again, you define your, uh, you define your property, which is a Boolean and uh, you run it. Now, what's interesting is in my original code, all the properties had to be int int, had to have two int parameters, like this one here, you know, had an extra parameter y here. But we don't need it. Uh, quick check or FS check is clever enough to uh, only have the, you know, only uses the parameters you need. You don't need to have random things being passed in. Right. So let's talk about. Uh, let's kind of do a little bit of a deep dive now into the internals of FS Check. Um, so let's start with the generators. And what there is is there's a generator for all the primitive types. There's an integer generator, which generates numbers like that, and there's a string generator. And it generates weird strings, right, like with weird Unicode characters and stuff. And there's a Boolean generator, which just generates true and false. Um, and it can also generate like pairs of ints and options of ints. And if you even define your own custom types, it will generate random versions of those. So if I have red, green, and blue, 
um, it will generate random versions. Of that. So it's very, uh, it's pretty powerful, uh, the generators. And we'll actually see some, I'll show you some examples of what the kinds of stuff you can do with them in a minute. And one nice thing about, one of the reasons that Prodigy based testing goes really well with functional programming is because in functional program we use algebraic data types. So we everything is either a product type, you know, a record or a tuple, or a, a sum type, a union. And these are bigger types are built from smaller types. And so if you have a generator for the two smaller things, you can create a generator for the bigger thing. Uh, in object oriented programming, it's much kind of harder to do that because Objects are not built from smaller objects in, in quite the same way using mathematical principles. So, right. So here's our community property. So it goes to the checker API and it says, oh, you've got a pair of ints. So I'm going to use the int, int generator and I'm going to generate these random integers. And then I'm going to feed it back into the property and, and I'm going to run it 100 times, or I'm going to run it with each of these generate numbers. And if any of them return false, it's going to tell me what the answer is. Now, I have to say, when it returns false, it might be one of the pairs might be quite large numbers, you know, because it's just random numbers. So nice to do the shrinking thing. So let's talk about how the shrinking works. So I'm going to, I've got a property here called it's, this number has to be smaller than 81. Okay. Now, that is true for numbers that which are smaller than 81, but any number bigger than 81, that's not true for. So this is a this will fail, but it will only fail for certain numbers. So how does QuickCheck deal with this? Well, first of all, it generates some integers, and it generates 1 and 3 and minus 2 and 34 and so on. And those all pass, and then it generates 100, and that fails. Okay, so we have a we have a failing test with 100, but that's not very helpful. Um, let's see if we can do better. So now it now that we've got a failing test, it turns on the shrinker, the th just shrinking thing, and the shrinking thing starts with 100 and says, generate me a whole bunch of numbers, all of which are smaller than 100. And depending on what the property is, like for strings, it's something, or for lists, it's something. But for integers, it's I'm using integers as an example because it's. Uh, pretty easy. So it basically generates a bunch of numbers like up to 99. Well, when we use this list, it now fails at 88. And it says, okay, let's start again. Let's start shrinking from 88. So let's generate all, a whole bunch of numbers, random numbers up to, but not exceeding 88. Now we run these numbers through it and it fails at 83 now. Okay. So we do it the whole thing again. We start from 83 and we go up to you know 83 and then 81 fails because 81 is not less than 81 okay now we shrink again now this time we generate a bunch of numbers and they all pass so for, for 81 they all pass so we can say that 81 is the smallest failing input so when you actually run this in fs check you get something like this it will say Here's my property. It's a falsifiable after three shrinks. Means it, it the first time it got to 100, and then it got to 83, and eventually got to 81. So it actually tells you the smallest number that will work. So it's very good to find where the boundaries are. You know, what's the smallest thing that will happen? And it works. Shrinking works for not just for integers, obviously, but everything. So let me show you how shrinking works. Uh, do I have it in this file? No, I don't. Uh, before I talk about shrink, I just show you one more thing about um, the addition. I, I forgot to tell you, is that when you when you have properties, you can take a bunch of properties and then you can add them together. So you have a, a property which consists of three other properties that all have to pass. So the whole the whole specification for addition is it has to be this property and this property and this property. So um, you can actually build build bigger properties from smaller properties, just like you can build bigger types from smaller types. Right. Okay. Let's go to working with FS check. It's shrinking, wasn't I? And let's see if these are still up there. Right. So open FS check. So here's our property, and I'm going to say. 
what's this what's the you know test this property well if this property failed falsifiable after 98 tests and three shrinks so the the original one that failed was 89 but it shrunk it it managed to shrink it to 81 and um what's cool is if i change this to some other number like 88 um and i run it now it figures it out as 88 so it's pretty good it's pretty good most of the time so let me just show you how that works if i want to say show me the shrinking list if i start up to 100 these are the numbers that go up to 100 so just like i showed you on the slides and it fails at 88 so i go up here and it now fails 83 so i say give me the numbers up to 83 and it goes up to 81, so 81 is going to fail. And then here's all the numbers up to 81. And these ones all pass. So this is, you can actually see these numbers being generated. So that's shrinking for you. And um, let me also talk about generators because um, people want to say, well, okay, how do I use these generators to make my own custom generators? So now we're going to kind of get into some heavy F sharp code here. So the raw generator is to generate a random number. Um, and here we have, it's called gen choose. It basically generates a number between, in this case, zero and a hundred, but it could be, you know, whatever, you could be anything you like. And then, um, that's generating one number, and that's generating another number. And there's this nice uh, computation expression, which basically lets you take this thing and lets you take this thing and returns the pair. So that's my generator that generates pairs of numbers. And if you look at the, the output, it says it generates pairs of integers, just like we think. And then the other thing, I'm basically going to take you through the FS check um, API, I think, for the next 10 minutes or so, just so you can see. I'm not expecting you to remember all of this stuff. Um, if you go to the uh, FS Check webpage, which is uh, yeah, all um, you know, a whole bunch of examples of all the different kinds of things you can do. So um, the once you've got some generators, when you're when you're testing stuff, you kind of interactively want to see is I just generated doing the right kind of thing so you can take a sample of the generators and that's called gen sample so I've got these pairs of numbers and let's take so here's here's 10 samples and they're all, all different random numbers um, the first number is between 10 and 20 and the second number is between 0 and 100 you can see there and there's actually two parameters to the sample thing the first one is something called size which I'll talk about in a minute. And the second one is the count, how many samples you want. So I want 10 samples. And the size doesn't isn't useful right now. One is you can take, you let's say you have a list of things that you want, like here's six numbers that I want to pick from. Um, I can just pick a random thing from that list. Um, I could also, let's say I've got, you know, some strings like, uh, uh, a, B, C, for example. Let me just pick some 10 samples from that strict list of strings. So there's a bunch of things you can do. Uh, shuffling is randomizes things, so you can shuffle the order. It's quite useful if you like want to have a random set of cards or something you're testing with. Um, and then you can, just like with lists and so on, there's a map function and there's a filter function. And the map function takes whatever you've generated and turns it into something else. So, for example, I'm generating integers here, but I want to turn. So here I've got random numbers between 1 and 10, but they're now being converted into strings. And obviously, you can anything you can do with a map, just like, you know. And I can also do filtering. So I'm going to take a number between 1 and 10, and I'm going to filter only out the even ones. And so these are, when I generate them, I get even numbers. Now, filter, I would say stay away from using filters if you can, because what you're doing is you're generating things and then you're throwing them away, which is really expensive. Um, 
you know, in this case, I'm throwing away 50% of the code of the numbers I'm generating. And that, you know, it uses up CPU and it's just often very efficient. And sometimes you might find the only one, one in a, in a one in a hundred of these things. It's, there's, there's a better way to do it. Almost always there's a better way to do it than using filtering. Um, so let me show you the other way. It's, it's better to generate, to construct things rather than to filter things out. So if I want to generate even numbers between one and 10, it's probably better to generate random numbers between one and five and then double it, right? Take a random number between one and five and double it. That's a much better way of generating evens because we're not throwing anything away. We're using every single number we get. So here's random numbers between, here's even numbers between one and 10. Okay, so there's this thing in FS check and in, in quick check called an arbitrary. And an arbitrary is a pair, it's a, it's a structure that has a pair of things. It has a generator and a shrinker. Because when we're doing these tests, we need to have both of them. Like for integers, you know, we needed to be able to generate integers, but we also need to know how to shrink them down. So an arbitrary is a combination of a generator and a shrinker. So here's the arbitrary uh, integer, the in arbitrary instance for integers. So I can generate random integers, and I can shrink random integers, or shrink, you know, shrink a certain number. Now this size parameter, uh, if you notice, I generated all these numbers with zero. Um, so I generated 10 samples, 10 items, but every single one is the same. So that's what the size thing is. It's a way of controlling the kind of uh, the variety um, of the things you generate. And uh, obviously for things like lists, it's, the, it, it's, it's like how big a list do you want to generate? And for strings, it's how big a string do you want to generate. And for integers, it's like what's the maximum integer you want to generate. So if I just generate, um, um, oops, if I generate with zero size here, then it's uh, going to be all zeros. But if I generate with a size of 100, it's going to be a lot more random. These are random numbers between 1 and 100. And here's some generating, I'm going to generate some random strings. And again, here's 10 random strings, but they're all exactly the same size. Uh, if I generate 10 random strings, but they're all size 10, or up to size 10, you can see their strings are completely different now. And notice they have a lot of weird stuff in them. They're just like, God knows, is that a tab character? I don't know why that's doing that. And this, there's some, I mean, just obviously there's something weird going on. There's like some non-printable characters coming out. Anyway, you can generate an int list. So it's pretty clever. You can pass in... Um, almost any type here, and it will generate them. So I'm passing a list of ints, an option of ints, uh, and a pair of ints and strings, and so on. Um, you know, so by default, it knows how to generate all sorts of cool things. So here's 10 random integers and strings, and the maximum length of the string is 10 characters. And, and you know, so you can see there's a pretty random. And when it generates random strings, it includes nulls, uh, which is good to check for nulls in your strings. You don't want to forget that. And then there are ways to make pairs of things. Like if I have uh, an integer generator, I can make a pair of integers. And if I have an integer generator, I can make a triplet of integers. So I've got triplets of things. And if I have an integer generator, I can make a list of things, a list of ints and and so on and you can there's different ones you can make a list you can make a list with a specific length this is a list of length four um so every every item that you get back is a four element list and you can make non-empty lists which is very useful sometimes you really want to make sure now it would normally generate empty lists as well so sometimes you, you specifically want non-empty lists okay so let's say we want to um generate a csv string we want to test our csv parser and we want to generate a CSV string with 10 fields in it. Now, one way is to generate a string and filter out all the strings that don't have nine commas in them. Now, the chances of having a string with nine commas is basically infinitesimal. And so if you filter them out, you're never going to basically, you're generating billions and billions of strings and all of them will be filtered out. So that's a bad way. This is why filters are a bad way to do it. What we want to do is construct it. So what we're going to do is generate um, 
10 strings and then concatenate them with commas. And that's a much better way of building a string with, with 10 fields in it. So if I do that and I generate them, thing with 10, let me just generate one sample. Whoops. There's a, there you go. There's my sample. It's got something and then a comma and then another comma and then another comma. So it should have nine commas. There's a, there's like, I'm thinking it's, it's a pretty random string. And if you, if you're testing your CSV parser, this is the kind of string you want to test it with. You know, you're not, this is the kind of thing you'll probably find all sorts of weird bugs because you have things you have. Here's like nothing at the beginning and there's quote signs right in the middle of it and everything. It's just like, it's a very weird string, but this is exactly why you do this kind of testing because you'd almost never write an example that would generate, you know, for you, you'd almost never write an example like this because, because we don't think of weird cases um, ourselves. Here's an example. I want to I have a, a type, which is a, a temperature. Uh, and the temperature is between Fahrenheit and uh, Celsius. And so I'm going to take, I'm going to create two generators. The first generator is going to choose a number between 32 and 2 and 12, and it's going to map it into the F case. So this generates temperatures, but it only generates F temperatures. Um, if I, okay, I'll, uh, let me just show you if I do, well, I'll show you in a minute. This one is going to choose a number between, whoa, I shouldn't have done that. Um, this is going to generate numbers between zero and a hundred and map them into the C case. And then we want to have these, these two generators, one that always maps F's and one that always creates C's. And we want to like alternate between them. So this is another option where you have you have two generators here, and I'm going to pick one each time I generate. I'm going to pick one of the two. So there we go. There's my um, sample. Sometimes it picks an F. Sometimes it picks a C. So if I did just the F generator on its own, it would always be Fs. And if I did the C generator on its own, it'd always be Cs. So by using by having this thing where you pick one or the other, you can get a nice random assortment of these two different things. Now, sometimes you want one of them to be more uh, common than the other one. So it might be that I'm doing an American thing, and I want 90% of them to be Fahrenheit and 10% of them to be uh, Celsius. So you can put you can actually put a weighting on the two different ones. That's one weighting, and that's the other weighting. So if I do this one. Um, you can see it's mostly Fs. There's a few Cs in there as well. Right, so let's, let's uh, this is the kind of common things. Like I've got this email address. I want to generate email addresses for my testing. Um, I go about doing that. Here's my email address type. And I want to make sure that they own, that they have a certain format. That they have an at sign in them um, because that's, you know, that's my test. So the, like I say, the bad, way is to start off with strings and filter out all the strings that uh, only include the ones that have at signs. And that's going to be really bad. One, one in a hundred times, 200 times will only match. Or maybe one in six. A better way is to create, is to take a string generator and make a pair. And then for each pair of strings, you just concatenate them like that. So this is a much better way of doing it. To, to find that type here. And if I do that, here is my, let me just generate one of them so you can see what's happening. There it is. It's got an at sign and then it's got something at the back. Now if I generate, it's like these are random. So every time I do it, it here's another one. It's got some, looks like some line feeds or something in there. I don't know whether line feeds are valid. Let me go, it's an at sign and it's just got two blank strings on the other side. So uh, to be honest, these are probably not very email addresses either. Um, what I do want to do is maybe filter out empty strings. So uh, let's do that. Let's make, make an empty string generator. Uh, uh, let me just generate one of them again. So there you go. But it's a pretty weird, it's got some spaces in it and it's got, I mean, I don't think that's a valid email address. When you're generating things, use the rules. So it turns out that email 
cells have a certain special syntax and you can go and look at Wikipedia and see where they are. There's a local part and it's letters and digits and printable characters only. And then there's a domain part, a host name part. Uh, it can have hyphens in it, but it can't have other things in it and so on. So um, that's the way we should do it. We should say, okay, okay, a character can be either A to Z or A to Z or zero to nine or, or one of these special characters we've got here. And then we've got this dot. And then we can say, okay, the first character can be any character. The second character can be any character. But the inner ones can be any character. Okay, and then we put them all together. Now I've got three different things. So I'm going to use map three. I'm going to make a big list of, and these are all characters. So I'm going to turn the characters into an array. And then I pass it into a constructor string. Out of it. It's kind of ugly. But hopefully you don't have to do this too often. Um, and again, rather than doing this map three, this map three can kind of get ugly when you have when it, you have more things. So you can use this generator, this generator computation expression. Right, and then the domain part is the same thing. It can be letters or numbers, and you can sometimes have a hyphen. Uh, uh, so you do that, blah 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 blah. So I'm just literally following the spec on how to build these things. So yeah, it's kind of ugly. Uh, so let's generate a domain. There you go. There's a domain. Uh, and then I can basically, to make an email, I just combine the two things with an at sign. So I've got the, the local part and the domain part and an at sign. And there's an email address, slash d5 at gh. There you go. But that is a valid, that is a valid email address. And so this is the kind of thing that you should be testing your code with. Now it turns out there's a there's a bunch of them built in. There's actually a built-in host name generator. Uh, here's ten random host names, and host names have a maximum. There's like a 256 character limit or something. So there you go. Um, and there's also an email address generator. Here's a random email address. Um, plus eight at emrck whatever. So these are just random. Obviously, they're really random, but they're good for testing. Right now, one final thing I want to say before I move on to the next bit, which is um, when you have a bad test, one of these things, that, one of the problems with these tests is, and so if you try and reproduce the test, you can't because they're random. But it turns out there is a way to reproduce them. And what happens is when you when you have a bad test that fails, this is a bad test, um, it tells you what the numbers is, but it says it's got these numbers. Here is the numbers that it for the random number generator. Uh, and if you use these same numbers to seed it again, you will get exactly. So this said it was 52 tests, and it originally was minus one. So I'm going to part. I'm going to take these two numbers here. I am going to paste them in here. Like that. So that's my seed. And then I'm going to stick that in their standard generator thingy. And um, here's my configuration. So what you do is you take their the FS check configuration and you change the safe seed to be this new thing. And then you can actually run FS check with a particular configuration. So I, we've been running it without a configuration. When we run it just like quick check, not any kind of configuration. But if you want to have a specific seed, that you test with over and over, you can actually sp specify the seed when you run it. So this time, if I run it, okay. Uh, yeah, we're Watch. waiting Just a wait. sec again because Skype was gone, and also the stream was obviously gone quite. But this was not our problem. I think this was YouTube. So maybe go on a bit. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll just yeah, just the last or said. last two sentences or so something. For, yeah, so the people who didn't say, I'm again, so I've got the seed, I set up a configuration which has that seed in it, and then when I run the when I run the um, tests, 
every single time I get exactly the same answer. It's no longer a random test now. It's um, the same number, 51 and 51. And 51 is like exactly the same test. So if you want to replay the tests or you want to have a certain seed that you use all the way through um, a test suite or something, that's how you do it. And you can do the same thing in Expecto. There's a way in Expecto to change the uh, configuration and the replay logic and so on. So that is best check. And now, now let's move on. So the question that people say is, OK, this is great. How do I come up with these properties? They're kind of hard. Uh, it, it hurts my brain to think of properties because I'm not used to thinking that way. Um, I don't even know where to start. So I'm going to show you some tips, uh, some ideas that you can use to come up with properties. And then we'll ha we've got time to do a little demo of uh, how you can use it to test FizzBuzz, for example. How would you how would you do a property Based test of FizzBuzz. I'll leave this as an exercise. You can think about this while I'm talking, okay? Because um, everyone knows how, you know, how would you test FizzBuzz in general without knowing what the answers are? You can't do example, but you can't say, well, if I pass in three, I expect to get Fizz. You're not allowed to do that, okay? Because that's an example based test. You have to come up with a test that doesn't, that means you don't know what the answer is. Think about that. Okay. Right. So the first one I'm going to show you, and this is one of the most powerful ones, is you go in, you go to the same destination via different paths. So you do something and you do something else, and then but if you go a different way, you get the same result. Now what's cool about this is you don't care what the result is. All you care is it's the same result in both directions. So if we, and, and this is normally called commutivity, uh, mathematicians call this, in in more general sense. A category theorist is called this commutivity. Um, so like the monad laws and that stuff, they, they follow this exact thing. So let's look about, let's say you want to sort a list. Okay, how would you test uh, whether a list sorting function was working without knowing what the answer is supposed to be? Well, what you can do is you can transform the list somehow and then sort it, that's one path, and then the other path is you sort it and then you transform it, and you get the same answer. So, for example, if I negate all the numbers in the list, let's say I have a list of numbers, and I negate them, and then I sort them. So I start with 2, 3, 1, and then I end up with minus 1, minus 2, minus 1. Now, if I take the original list and I sort it, and then I negate it, and then I reverse it, I should get the same list. So negating and reversing should uh, should give me back the same list, no matter how... You see, I don't actually care what the list is, but doing these operations on the list, hopefully, you know, that should pretty, that pretty well checks whether the sort function works or not. And we'll see a lot of this. This is a really good way of doing most property tests because, again, you don't need to know what the answer is. All of these, all of these things I'm going to show you are you, assuming that you don't know what the answer is. In example-based testing, you do know what the answer is before you test. And in these example, in this in this approach, you do not know what the answer is before you test. It's a very different way. So you have to really think about it. So this is one of them. As long as you get the same answer different ways, that's good. Um, and let's say you want to test whether a certain function works. Normally, this is like mapping, right? So let's say I'm multiplying something by three. Like you start with a normal number, let's say two. Now, if I multiply uh, something by three and then create an option out of it, it's the same as if I create an option out of the original number and then use map, right? So if I take two and then multiply it by three and then turn it into an option, that's the left hand. That's the right hand side. It's the same as if I start off by creating an option and then use option map to get to the same answer. So that's a good way to test. Does option map work? I mean, that's that would be a good way to do a property based test for my option map fun, my uh, option map implementation. Does it do this? And this is actually one of the laws of of a map function. A map function should follow this kind of law. Okay. Now another really common thing to do is if you do something and you do it again, or you do the opposite of it, you should get back to where you started. And again, you don't care what the original thing was as long as it's the same when you come back to it. 
So, for example, serialization and deserializing something. If I take something, if I take an object and I serialize it to JSON and I deserialize it back from JSON, it should be the same object. Otherwise, your JSON serializer doesn't work. Uh, if I add something and then I subtract something, I should end up back with the original number. Otherwise, my addition's not working. If I write to a file and then I read from the file, I should have the same data. So it's not exactly, they're not exact inverses. Like reading and writing are not, are not inverses, but it's doing something and then doing kind of the opposite or the, 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 the in, going in the other direction. Uh, setting a property on an object and then getting the property back, if you do that, it doesn't really matter what the property is. You know, you don't care what the value of the property is, but if you set it and then you get it, you should get the same thing back. Well, it's kind of obvious, but these these tests are a good way to find uh, mistakes in your code. So, for example, uh, reversing a list. If I reverse a list and I reverse it again, I get the original list back. So that's a good way to test whether my reverse function is implemented properly. Now, another thing is things that never change no matter what you do. So if you transform a list, like mapping a list, uh, the number of items in the list is still the same number. Like the list length hasn't changed. The items might have changed their what they're in, or the or the order of the items might have changed, but the, the count of the items hasn't changed. So the size of a collection is a property that is nice that often doesn't change when you do things. When you sort something, the size doesn't change. When you do a map, the size doesn't change. Uh, the contents of the collection, like uh, if you sort something, the contents hasn't changed. They're just in a different order. Uh, and when you're doing things like balanced trees, you know, uh, uh, a red-black tree or one of those kinds of things, there's certain properties that are constraints that you always guarantee. No matter what you, no matter what you do, it follows the constraints. So again, if I took my sorting thing, um, the enterprise developer from hell can beat this by an evil sort. Uh, which is just making an empty list. So my first, I said it was a really good way of writing properties, and it is, except that the evil sort works. If you negate something and then you sort it, by the very fact of sorting it basically throws away everything in the list. So this passes this particular property, but this is how you can get around it. It's not, you normally want more than just one property because the way to beat this one is not just to pass this test, but also uh, to ensure that the contents are still there. So, you know, it's, but if I have another test that says, no matter how you sort it, it must be a permutation of the original list, that will work because, you know, he can't just throw away all the numbers. They have to be one of these permutations. So the combination of having it be one of these permutations and also that other property of the negation and stuff, that will pretty much guarantee that you have a correct implementation. So that's one way to beat. So when you're writing this stuff, think about what what could the evil enterprise developer do to make your life miserable? Okay, and you can try and how can you beat him? And then there's another one, which is when you do something twice, it doesn't change. Like if you if you take the distinct elements in a list and you do that again, the second time is the same as the first time because nothing's changed. And if you sort something twice, it doesn't change. If you sort it the first time and then you sort it the second time, the second sorted list is the same as the first sorted list. It doesn't change when you sort it again. So that's another very common one. So item potence with sort, filtering. If you filter something, if you filter out all the even numbers and you filter again, you still got a set of even numbers. You know, Event processing, very important when you're doing event processing. It's actually a really important thing for distributed designs. But that's a whole other topic. Right. Um, recursing is very nice in these kinds of things. You solve a smaller problem first. So rather than solving the whole thing, you just solve little bits and then you build it back from that. So divide and conquer algorithms like quicksort are great for that. Um, and this is another really nice one it's called hard to prove, easy to verify. So for example, if I'm trying to solve a maze, it's really hard to prove uh, I mean, it's hard to kind of prove that my implementation is correct, but I, it's easy to verify that my implementation is correct because it's like I can just see, can you get from one maze? You know, if I follow the path, do I get to the other end? So, I mean, a classic example of this is prime number factorization. It's really hard to actually do it, but once you have done it, you can prove that, that those are factors, right? Many, many things to do. So here's an example. Let's say I want to tokenize a string. I want a, a tokenizer. Um, 
how do I prove that my tokenizer works? Well, I can't really prove it, but what I can do is take the strings that it spits out and combine them back together again, and that should give me the original string back. So the original string and the string after they've been concaten concatenated should be the same. So that's my way of that's my way of verifying that something would work. Um, again, for sorting a list, it's quite easy to check whether a list is sorted. You just compare the, each item pairwise, and each item should be smaller than the next item. So I can't prove that the whole list is sorted, but if each pair is sorted, that goes a long way uh, to proving the whole list is sorted. And then finally, there's something called the test oracle, which means that you have a system you're trying to test, but there's also some other system that you know is correct. And you can compare them and see if they have the same answer. So if you have a, a, a like, let's say you have quick sort and you have merge sort, um, you know, and you're implementing one of them, you can test it against the other one to make sure it works. Or if you have a distributed, if you have a parallel algorithm and a, a serial algorithm, you can make sure they give the same answer. So, you know, the, the, typically one of the algorithms might be much slower, but it's also much easier to prove that it's correct and you can just compare them. Right, so let me demonstrate some of that. Uh, and this is now up to E, right. So, have we had any questions yet, Roman? Okay, yeah, so we had some questions, but I would put them in the end discussion, I think. It's it's mainly about how to, to use it in the real world. <laughs> um, but I would suggest to to you to do those in the end, actually. Yeah, okay. So keep right. going. Doing right. good. So I'll just yeah, I'll just keep going with this. Okay, so here we have a FizzBuzz implementation. And um, I'm sure you've all seen this. Nice using active patterns. This is one nice thing about F sharp active patterns. And there's the actual implementation of FizzBuzz right there. Um, so let me just quickly test. Do I get something that looks like FizzBuzz. Those things look like FizzBuzz to me. Right, now, how, how would you go about testing it? So, as I said, um, the bad way is to basically re-implement it. So, okay, I'm gonna, here's my actual answer, and I'm gonna say, what's the expected answer? Well, if it's divisible by 15, it's this, and if it's divisible by three, it's this. I'm basically re-implementing FizzBuzz in my test. And that's a really bad way of doing it because I know, first of all, I'm re-implementing all the code. And secondly, it's assuming, I'm assuming the answers. If, if you know, we want to have a test that, where you don't know what the answer is. Okay. So, I mean, I can do this. I'm going to write a little property here. And is the implementation the same as my expected? And it says, yes, it passed 100 tests. It's all good. Right, so let's talk about, let's start, I'm going to work backwards. I'm going to start with the Oracle, which is good for comparing uh, different implementations. Um, so I, here's my sort algorithm. I'm calling it my sort. Okay. And it's basically a quick sort style. Uh, if, if there's a thing I'm going to pay, I'm going to create smaller and larger groups and then put the smaller one in front of the head and then the larger after that. Now I'm gonna compare it with this library sort, which is built in to F sharp. And then my property is that I do my sort and I do the library sort and I should get the same answer. So let me run it and it fails. So it said it failed. This is the, the, the number of the list it failed of, but it managed to shrink this down to zero one zero. Um, and that failed. And the reason it failed, because if I actually take my sort and, and, and demonstrate it on a list, on this list here, it doesn't actually sort it. So I got a bug in my sort logic. And the reason is because I'm actually not doing this recursively. 
I need to sort the smaller lists and the bigger lists. OK, now, do I have confidence that this code works? Let me try again. And there it go. Past 100 tests. So I have, I'm pretty confident by comparing it 100 times with the library, I'm pretty sure that my uh, implementation works now. So there you go. That's good. That's Oracle testing. Now, let's do a FizzBuzz Oracle. Now, this is my, this is one of my favorite. This is, I call the carbonated FizzBuzz. And um, I'm going to, each step in the FizzBuzz is going to be a result. It's basically the result type specialized to carbonated things. So in one case, it's going to be a string, and the other case, it's going to be an integer. It means it hasn't been processed yet. So if it's divisible by three or whatever, it's going to be carbonated. And if it isn't divisible by three or whatever, it's not going to be carbonated. And then I have a way of chaining these together. So if it is carbonated, I'm done. And if it's not carbonated, I call the next function in the, in the pipeline. So this is actually monadic fizzbuzz here for people who like that kind of stuff. So here's my monadic version of fizzbuzz. Now the question is, is this the same implementation? Have I got this implementation right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test it with the original version of FizzBuzz, and here's my monadic version, and hopefully they give the same answer. And yes, they do. But if I'd had a mistake, if I'd had biz rather than buzz, and I check that, it says, oops, I made a mistake, and it failed on number five. Well, yeah, five is exactly right. It failed because I got the five bit wrong. So that's kind of cool. So that's checking one implementation of FizzBuzz with another implementation of FizzBuzz. Now, let's look at the uh, the going through different paths thing that I talked about. So here is my sorting list. I'm just going to use the built-in list, but I'm going to have an evil sort in a minute. So there's my correct sort. And what I said is I'm going to negate the list. That's how you negate. So my first list is I sort it, and then I negate it. And the second list is I negate it, and then I sort it. And if I do that, and then I check that, it fails. So it turns out that I got a bug, and it and the, the answer to the bug is I'm not actually. Remember, I said you actually need to reverse after you've negated it. You need to reverse it. So if I take that as my property now, now it passes. So the idea is that. When I fix the when I fix the implementation, um, or I fix the test, I have a much higher confidence than I do with example-based tests because it's generating so many different ones. Now, if I do the evil sort, which just returns an empty list, does it pass the property check? Yes, it does. So as I said, this is this property are not good enough. I'm going to have to have another property which says that it's 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 a permutation of the original list or something like that so you, it's not normally one property on its own it's not good enough you need, need multiple properties and it's the combination of the properties that spec that provide the specification just like with addition it was the, the combination of commutivity and associativity and identity all three of them needed to define addition i showed on the slide uh yeah, i'm gonna i'm gonna um Take any, I, actually, I don't think I showed this. I'm going to take an item and append something to it and then reverse the list. And that should be the same as reversing the list first and then prepending an item to it. So appending and then reverse should be the same as reversing then prepend. And let me just see if that's true. So I'm, this is my way of checking whether reverse. So if reversing. Uh, didn't do that, then it would it would be if I use something else instead of reverse, it would fail. Right. So here's the thing about. Let me go back to FizzBuzz again. What can we do, do these two different paths in FizzBuzz? Like, is there two different ways to get to the same answer in FizzBuzz? Well, if you think about it, FizzBuzz only works on three and five. So if I take a number which is co prime to three and five, like seven and I multiply the input by seven, then I should get the same answer. Um, because if the number's already divisible by three, it will still be divisible by three. And if it's divisible by five, it will still be divisible by five. And it's not if it's not divisible by three or five, 
uh, it still won't be divisible by three and five. So if I do take the original number and I do fizzbuzz, I take it number times seven and I do fizzbuzz, I should get the same answer. Oops, no, I didn't get the same answer. It failed on number one. And the reason it failed is because I'm not taking the case of the last thing where the fizzbuzz just returns the string of the integer. So for number one, it's returning one, and for this one, it's returning seven as a string. So, okay, this is no good. But I think this is a good idea. Let's see if we can run with this and make this into a test that does work. And the, the thing to be aware of is that fizzbuzz, sometimes it transforms the input and sometimes it doesn't. Right? Sometimes it leaves the input alone and sometimes it doesn't. So we, ha we have a good type for that already, which is the option type. Um, so I'm going to make a version of fizzbuzz which doesn't return the string, it returns an option. If it transforms it, it's going to return something. And if it doesn't transform it, it's going to... So this is what I call optional fizzbuzz. Okay. And we can get the original fizzbuzz from that really easily because we just run it through the optional fizzbuzz and then if it didn't do anything, we just return the, the string of n. But here's my property. Using the optional fizzbuzz, if if it was if it was like the one and the seven and stuff, they're going to be nuns now. So this one actually works. This one passes a hundred tests. So this is quite nice. Um, by by changing the definition of fizzbuzz a bit, I actually made it easier to test. And I actually think this is actually a better version of FizzBuzz anyway. This is a good way. This is one of the reasons why probability-based testing can help you design your APIs, because this is actually a more flexible API. The original FizzBuzz always returned a string. Um, this one allows you to actually do more interesting things. Once it's returned a string, it's really hard to work with it. But for example, if I want to find out what all the numbers affected by FizzBuzz, I can basically take these numbers, run it through the optional thing, and if it is found, I'm going to take the pair of the result and the number. So that is something with the original FizzBuzz, because there's no way to filter out the ones which were fizzy and the ones which weren't fizzy. But here I can actually say, you know, if I'm trying to like do some data science and I'm trying to look at some patterns, I can actually see the pattern in FizzBuzz and say, oh, and see if I can deduce what the algorithm is. So um, I'll skip this inverses verification yeah here's another one for fizzbuzz i mean sometimes verification can be very simple like for fizzbuzz i can just say doesn't contain one of these strings i mean i don't really at this point i could say it doesn't have to be perfect but it might might catch some typos for example um so the property is uh does it contain fizz or buzz or fizzbuzz um and it does so, like, like I could say, it's not. It doesn't. It wouldn't be stat. And on, on this test on its own is not good enough. But it will probably, like I could say, it will catch like silly mistakes, like typos and things, quite well. Right. Let's let's uh, just look. Finish up with this one. Uh, I'm talking about parsing a CSV file. Um, so let's say I want to parse a CSV, and this is actually the built-in split function in .NET. Um, and this parses a it parses a, a string. At, at the comma, uh, and it's also going to remove uh, empty entries, which is probably not correct for CSV, but there you go. So what I want to do is generate, like I did before, I want to generate random strings um, uh, that I can then con concat together. So it's going to pass in an array of strings. I'm going to concat them together with comma, and I'm going to parse it um, using that that, that function, but then what do I expect the output the parse to be? Well, it's got the strings, but also, just like this thing does, it's removing empty entries, so I should remove all the empty entries as well. So let me test this property and see what happens. How many people think this property will work? Let's see. It failed. And look at what it found. Now, look, this is very interesting. The original one that it failed on was this weird list of strings. And it managed to shrink it down to this list of strings, or this array of strings, rather. And what's interesting about this string is it contains a comma. So if the input string contains a comma, it's really going to mess up my logic. 
because I'm, um, you know, it, it, the um, the CSV parser is going to throw that comma away, but I'm I'm including it in my list. So that my thing is not great. Custom strings that don't have commas in them, and this is how you do it. And I'm not really going to go into it in too much detail, but you know, you can see it generate a string, filter out the ones that contain commas. Now that filter is okay because almost all the strings won't have commas. So it's only the occasional string that has a comma. So that's fine. That's fair enough. Um, and then I basically pass this thing into a special configuration. So I'm using the default FS check, but I'm saying when you generate strings, use these use these things to do it. So let me fix that. And then if I test, uh, oh, it's an error. What's the error? Null reference exception, because it's generating null strings. OK, so let me add that as well. So yeah, there's a lot of interactive stuff, getting things to work, which is kind of painful. But it's interactive. You know, you're playing with it, and you're learning. And then finally, it now has passed all its tests. So that's good. And I think that's everything I need to know about that. OK, so I'll go back to the slides, and I'll just finish up with another five minutes of slides, if you don't mind. So I'm going to talk about something else, which is related to property-based testing. Um, it's, uh, the idea is when you want to test things, and again, you don't know what you're looking for. Um, you're just testing. You're trying to test you know, the, the, the logic of things, but you don't actually know what you're going to do. Um, and this is basically the same thing as the test oracle. You have You have an idea of what it should do, and then you test it against the real thing and see what it actually does. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's say you want to have you have a database, and it has one row, uh, and in that row there is one field, and in that field there is a number. So there's basically opening and closing the database and incrementing and decrementing that number. That's your entire database operations. Obviously, that's very crude. But I mean, if that doesn't work, then you've got problems with locking or something, right? So you have two clients. You, you're trying to test like a, a parallel system, a multi-user system um, with concurrency. So what Quick Check does is it generates random lists of actions. So for client A, it says open, increment, close, increment, open, close, you know, whatever. And for client B, it says open, decrement, open, open, increment, whatever, random actions. So then what you do is you take these random actions and you run them on your real database, but you also run them on a very simple in-memory model. All right. So that's what the real system is doing. And then you have a model in memory with the same thing. And your memory model, you can say, well, OK, this is what should happen if you open and close. And you know, I'd expect it to be incremented or decrement, whatever the thing is, where there's a locking thing going on. You can just make a very simple model for what you expect your database to do. And then when you test it on the real system, hopefully it does the same thing. And if it doesn't do the same thing, you've got a bug in your concurrency logic in your database. So. Um, this is really, you know, like for example, in the, the the model says you start with zero, and as soon as you see the increment, it's one, uh, and then the second client decrements it, so it's zero. But the third, the first client tries to increment it, but the database isn't open, so they can't. All right, so the connection's closed, uh, and then finally the second client increments it, and they do have an open connection. It's one, and so on. So you, this is what you by the end of this thing, you'd expect to have one. And then you run it in the real system, and you look in your database, and is it in the record in that field, is it one? And if it's not, you've got a bug. So um, John Hughes used something like this to find some very subtle bugs in an Erlang module. Um, and it was very, very hard to produce. They, they had these bugs where they were losing data in a database, which was supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be super uh, immune to losing data, and yet the database will crash something. You need to lose data over someone, and it turns out they had to do three different op three different clients running in parallel, and they each had to like open and then close and then open the file, and then do something at the same time, and they all had to happen concurrently in a certain order. Now you would never ever ever write a, a test for this, 
but uh, the quick check thing found this and again because it shrank it like the first example it found it might have done 40 different operations but by the time it did the shrinking it reduced it down to three operations but what's interesting that's the smallest number of operations you could get away with you can't get away with two clients it had to be three clients and you couldn't get away with just opening and closing it had to be open close open whatever so you know it's a great way of finding this stuff and he found the whole thing they'd been working on this for like a couple of months and he found it in an hour so that was kind of nice so it's very important to this so there's a great uh, war story from john hughes i highly recommend watching this video right so let's finish up we've got example based tests we've got property based tests um why are they different so property based tests as we see they're much more general they can test all sorts of stuff and one single test or one suite of tests can create hundreds of example based tests like with the addition i created three different properties and i'm pretty sure i guarantee it works so three different properties and these edge cases like you know forgetting about nulls forgetting about negative numbers forgetting about strings with weird unicode characters in them or whatever um and most importantly is it's this deep understanding of the requirements you really you can see even when i was playing around with it i got errors and i had to like tweak my properties and it really helped me understand what am I actually trying to do. They force you to think. That's why people don't like them. Um, we don't like to think. We just like to code if we can get away with it. But thinking is really good for you sometimes. So now it doesn't mean the example based. These are not uh, in opposition. Example based tests are really useful. Like for example, two plus two equals four is a great example of how addition works. So if I'm doing documentation or I, if I just want some basic tests that other developers can look at, and say, you know, two plus two equals four. And here's an example of how that works. That's great. And if you're doing test-driven development uh, and you want to kind of test your track, or rather I'd say test-driven design, where you're trying to use your, uh, you know, you're trying to play with your API as you write it and to make sure it's easy to use, then example-based tests are great for that. Um, but they, you know, you have to be careful. Example-based tests can often have little edge cases that you forget about because we're just human. And uh, yeah, example-based tests are much less abstract. They're much more concrete. So be lazy. Don't write tests. Generate them if you can. And use property-based testing to get some insight into the requirements that you might not otherwise get. Much. Uh, I'm on Twitter. You probably know me. And on my um, website, um, I have my old slides and video. That's like they're about six years old. So they're really ancient. And I think if I go here on my um, GitHub there, I have the links here. There's the links. This is on this GitHub prop thing that I just created for today. Um, there's the link to FS Check. There's the link to Expecto. And there's my ancient PevShop fund profit. So, yeah, you can play with this code yourself. Um, hopefully it will work. I actually haven't tested it. I only wrote this, this GitHub like a, you know, a few hours ago. So... Let me know if you've got any pull requests Let me to fix things. Let me know. So I think that's it for the main part of the talk. And now I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Cool. Wow. That was a nice one, Scott. Thank you very much for this. Um, let me. Yeah. Uh, let me just. Can you can you um, reactivate can your camera so that people I can actually can. see you? Let me see if I can do that. And I should stop. I should probably keep the screen sharing. Yeah, leave, leave yeah. it on so if, so if, I can there, see. if there is anything. So let me go um, through this, all this stuff. So first of all, thinking is really good for you sometimes. I, I like this. I will put this somewhere in my bio or something. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a good one. Um, so I uh, need to recheck your, your size again. So we can go through this. Stuff. Let me see if I can. Uh, if this works here. Um, so basically, the the the, I think the the basic question that is coming most of the time is, um, Zaid had this question, but a lot of people were were giving plus ones for this. Is how does one apply FS check or quick uh, or property based testing in the real world beyond software with mathematical properties? I think you showed a couple of those. Um, yes. And so, for example, Devin was, was writing that his experience was writing a lot of custom generators, for example. So, but he said yep. he, he might be doing it wrong, 
but um and and if if you're talking about this um it's also if if you're if you're in this domain driven design area do you think you can use it there as well if you have like like business um software or is this because it's it seems to be very algorithm um algorithmic a lot of times right yeah i think there's a place for it i mean um it's not just mathematical stuff for example um there's someone called oscar uh i can't remember his name, oscar hilston i can't remember his last name he was doing a video tool a uh, video editing tool i think it was and he was using property based testing Uh, to check that his tr video transforms where you would do certain manipulations of the video mm -hmm. would um, be correct. Like if you, you know, if you shrink the video and then you make it black and white, it's the same thing as making it black and white and then shrinking it or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and there's another example um, uh, in the, in the, there's a good te uh, talk by some, a Scala guy. I don't have the link. I can post them mm -hmm. later on. Um, and he was talking about, let's say you do face facial recognition. Um, and, you know, checking that your facial recognition algorithm works is to have hundreds of images which have been manually tagged with the bounding box of the face. And then okay. you check that your mm -hmm. algorithm is the same thing. But his is another way of doing it, which is you take an image. And remember I said you don't know what the answer is. So what you do is you take an image and it comes up with a bounding box for the face and then if you take the image and you turn it upside down the, the bounding box should also be turned upside down and if you take the image and you make it black and white you should get the same bounding box and if you take the image and you squeeze it or distort it you should get this distorted version of the bounding box so you can do just like i was saying the two different um directions that end at the same result you can actually do a lot of these things without even knowing what the right answer is, as long as the trans as the transfer transformation works. Now, again, these are kind of they're I wouldn't say they're mathematical, but they are using mm -hmm. algorithms. You're testing the algorithms work. For domain driven design, a lot of the stuff in domain driven design yeah. is not algorithms. It's more generic yeah. business logic. And I in that case, I don't know that property based testing, that might be overkill. Because like I say, you have to think it's a bit slower to write property based tests. And you have to decide what's the trade-off between the confidence. Um, you know, they, 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 they give you a lot of confidence, but it's also yes. slower mm -hmm. in many ways, unless you get used to it. But it is it is harder to think of properties. So in domain-driven design, um, I wouldn't use property-based testing by default. Uh, well, first of all, it's nothing to do with the design. It's to do with the implement. You're yeah. testing the implementation, you know. Um, but it's a good way. It, like I say, it's a good way to – it does help you think about – What if you had somebody who was doing an evil implementation? How would you know whether mm -hmm. they've done that or not? Oh, that's a good heuristic, then. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's a, a good, good heuristic it. for, for for those cases. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's the same. I mean, there's other property-based testing. There's similar ones like the fuzzers, right, where they fuzz the code or they fuzz the the binary and generate different outputs. And those fuzzers are extremely effective at finding bugs that people didn't know about. And there's also similar ones where they manipulate the source code that, you know, like if you change all the pluses to minuses in your source code, hopefully your tests will detect that. If your tests do not detect that, your tests aren't mm -hmm. good enough, you know. So um, there's a whole movement. It's not just property based testing, but there's other similar things where you're generating random stuff. It's a way to get away from um, we tend to fall on comfortable examples and thinking in a more adversarial thing. Think about somebody who's trying to write the worst possible code. How would you know that they did that? Yeah, I like this. This is a good heuristic that, that we can take for this, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what else do we have? Zaid was asking, can we generate arbitrarily nested tree structures from com compound recursive types like a binary tree? And then Paul, oh man, Paul, sorry, I don't know, Blazucci, yes, yes, Blazucci, yeah. I don't know, or Blazucci, I don't know what, how do you pronounce your last name, but he said already yes. But it's pretty, because you we can have those compound generators, right? Um Uh, yes, if I go, let me just yeah. share my screen again. And uh, if I go to the, I think he actually has an example of, in the FS check 
uh, website, there is actually a thing about uh, generating recursive trees. I can't remember what it is. There's something on the FS Check website about generating um, mm -hmm. uh, recursive trees, but I don't know where it is now. Yeah, here's a tree generator. So, yeah, I, I'm. And this is just the basics, really, to get you to understand it. When you actually use it, it does take a while to use it, and there is a lot of stuff in FS Check to get your head around. Um, I'm not, I'm not an expert in FS Check, and um, so. But 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 it should be possible, right? Yeah, in general, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I switch back um to this. So is there anything else left? Um, Martin was asking, how do I know if I have enough properties to test for? <laughs> That's a good. Well, how do you know you have yes, any, same, enough example-based tests? Yeah. It's the same thing. Same question. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I would say that I have confidence. Like I say, yeah, the evil the evil developer can, um, you know, like I say, even if you think you've got a good property, they might be able. To, the evil developer might find an implementation that defeats it. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, definitely, but um, normally, you know, if you have three or four properties, it it covers an awful lot. I mean, uh, you know. It's amazing how powerful they are. Like the mapping prop, the commutativity and the mapping approach is really mm -hmm. covers a lot of ground very quickly. Yeah, you so. really need to think about your properties and about the laws. And, and by the way, people were trying to start a drinking game for every time you say Monad, but it was just, just three <laughs> times or something. So I think people are... I only said it. You said it once, yeah, and then there was twice often, the monadic, uh, monad, monadic, yeah, yeah. So. Monadic fizz buzz, monadic fizz buzz. That's just the fun of fun of you all. <laughs> I didn't want because there's no mon there's no monads here, but I thought a monadic fizz buzz would be a fun thing to show you. <laughs> okay. Um, da -da 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 -da. What's the best way these days for running FS check from FSX scripts or scripts? So um, I don't know. You know that I think there so were a couple you, of. Can you repeat that? Because I, I, what's the best I way? A, I just woke up. What's the best way these days for running oh, FS check from an um, F sharp script or FSX check, um, script? Yeah, I I lost you again. I my fit my things. What's the best way to do it interactively? Was yeah, question? pretty much yes. Well, I've been doing. I've been running it interactively. So, so you, these have been when I'm these are this is I'm running what do you, I mean I'm running into these are all FSX scripts. Ah, uh, because he he said notice the repo has the binaries copied in, so it's it's basically ah. the question of the, of the dependency management in FSX, and I think this will be hopefully solved yeah. in um, .NET five, right? So um, I think there were a couple of, yeah, of answers. Yeah, what I normally do is I normally create a project. Um, the way I do it is I create a a project. Uh, and I put the dependencies in the project, and then I build the project once, and that builds all the dependencies in. Um, I just put them. I put the dependencies right in the library for some. But like Packet supports this kind of thing. I just wanted to make it easy without having to, people to install Packet. But uh, um, if I if I wasn't if I wasn't embedding it, what I like I say what I'd normally do is just is either create a project, uh, or I could use Packet from the command line, or I'd create a Visual Studio project and then just. Just um, compile it, to, yeah. and it would get me the dependencies yeah. for yeah, me. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think that's it, pretty much. If if I missed something that is like pretty urgent, you can you can still write in there. But I think that's basically it. I have you have you used this model based testing in that is implemented in in FS Check? I, I I had a look at it once. It's it has quite a strange API. I felt like this at least. Um, have you used this? Yeah. No, I haven't, to be honest. I'm just explaining how it works. But I think, I think that's one of the things. That's not necessarily the strong point of FS Check. Yeah. I think that's the, that's not something that's been focused yeah. on. Yeah, I was talking to Isaac a lot about this a couple of months ago, and and it it has those object expressions a lot in there, and it's really strange to set this up. But maybe someone can can share some light 
onto yeah, this. Yeah, I think it's just the concept. I mean, you, yeah. you could probably write your own equivalent. Yeah. I mean, or you could use. I mean, if someone wants to work on that, that would, I'm sure that would, uh, you know, that would be a, a useful contribution. Yeah. But yeah, it's not really commonly used. But I just wanted to show that it's a concept that is yeah. available. Pretty cool. Okay, cool. I think that's it for today. I, I just want to say, someone, I think Zaid also said this, uh, our peak was more than 200 people. Um, wow. Yeah, pretty awesome. So so, so here for, for each of you, and pretty awesome that all of you were there all the time. And even now, it's, it's more than 115. Um, online and we had a good good um, conversations in the chats and some f um, jokes as well so it was good so if you have any feedback uh, for this kind of format or for this for this kind of user group if you want to see more please please give it to me give it to us give it to roman if if you want the the other roman if you want to have something differently or you don't like me as a host or whatever just give me the the some feedback and we will try to to arrange as much as possible also a lot of people were um saying that they could give talks which is pretty cool so paul was talking about active patterns matthew was also um having the suggestion that he could because they're using property-based testing in their production system all the time so that he could make a follow-up about practical property-based testing, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and and Dave uh, Seven Sharp Nine was was um, suggesting to talk about Myriad. Um, so a lot of cool topics, and I guess there are a lot more. Um, I will put or I will think about with Roman um, how we can actually have a call call for speaker or something, and we will put this into the meetup. And then we can have a um, then we can have people just applying for this, and then we can sort those things out. And at the moment, I feel people really want this, and especially with all the lockdowns that we have here as well in Germany, with all my kids at home and my wife and me at home all the time, people are really longing for something like this. So I would love to to have the next um, meetup maybe already in two weeks. We don't have a topic yet. But I would love to do it today in two weeks. And um, so let's see what we can work out. So, okay, people giving thumbs up. That's good. So thanks, Scott, for, for being the first speaker of this and, and saying yes immediately when I asked you a couple of days ago. So the idea was born on Friday. Mm -hmm. So and we are already here, not, not even a week later. So it's pretty cool. And um, thanks, Scott, for this awesome talk. So Thank you. all of you, what you just said, thinking is really good for you sometimes. See you and good night. Bye bye.